This behind me is a Boeing X-36, which was a 28th scale representation of a possible fighter jet. Now what's interesting is that it has no tail, um, and also because it's so small, there's no human that could fit into it, so it was all flown by remote control. Now the whole program apparently was an incredible success, and then it stopped and nothing happened, so it makes you wonder if there's a slightly larger version of this out there that's still classified and we won't see it for another 10 or 20 years, although that's pure speculation, but it's on the internet so it must be true. And a massive thanks to the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio for letting me film this and many other aircraft, with many more videos on my channel. Let's have a look around this fascinating aircraft. Designed in top secret by McDonnell and NASA, starting in 1993 and it first flew in 1997. Important design characteristics were the remote control, the relatively large canards, and no empennage, which is also known as the tail section. While drones and tailless designs such as the B-2 Spirit don't seem like anything special now, back then this really was state of the art. Tail sections usually consist of vertical and horizontal sections which provide stability and a number of different control surfaces. But the extra structure increases drag which reduces speed and increases fuel consumption and it also adds extra weight. Significantly, they also increase the radar return, hence why the B-2, which doesn't need to be overly manoeuvrable, doesn't have one. Modern fighters will be destroying each other from hundreds of miles away via advanced missiles, so stealth is increasingly important to avoid the enemy missile's control systems. These missiles are a bigger concern than the ground-based military radars, which will know that you're there, but without a radar lock, they won't be able to do a great deal about it. Other variations of a tail section include the YF-23 with a wider V-tail, which was a blend between the vertical and horizontal surfaces, and I have a separate video where I talk you around that design. Obviously not having the standard tail section raises the questions of how it does control pitch and roll. Now we will come back to the engine itself, but it does have a thrust vectoring nozzle, which like the F-22 Raptor, could angle the thrust. Looking at the tail here, you can see this discoloration from the heat and inside it is an empty space where the engine once was. This really is a prototype and not just a museum display. On the wing's trailing edge were split ailerons, also known as decelerons. To roll, they could activate, as usual, up or down, but they could also split both up and down at the same time on the same wing, causing the whole plane to twist, called a yaw, as you can see with this B2 Spirit. They could also all deploy, acting as speed brakes, as you can see on this A-10. On a traditional airplane, the yaw would be controlled by the rudder. If you look closely here, you'll see X-36-1, and this was the first of two ever made. This one at the National Museum of the USAF is the only one that ever flew. Prototype number two was static and is now on display at Edwards Air Force Base. I'll also mention the badges, as NASA was heavily involved with this. And there's Boeing's logo, because in 1997, McDonald, who were building this, merged with Boeing, hence the new name. This here is the forward canard. This has the advantage of generating lift itself, like another wing, and because it pivots in the middle, it is another control surface for pitch and roll, both of whom can be otherwise controlled by the tail section, which again this does not have. Potential negatives include downwash, that it might create adversely affecting the main wing behind it, and the extra weight and complexity, and it would also increase the aircraft's radar return, thus reducing the stealthiness. Moving down here, we have the side-mounted air intakes with a boundary layer of turbulent air removed via here, and the engine will be sitting deep inside the fuselage to keep those fan blades away from enemy radar waves. Different aircraft have experimented with different air intakes and stealthiness. The B-2 and the Tacit Blue both ingest air above the fuselage, although the intakes there would be starved during high angles of attack, as the fuselage would have blocked the airflow. There are underside intakes such as the F-16, although all of the extra bits underneath the fuselage's smooth underside will light up on a radar, so the general consensus seems to be to stick with side-mounted intakes if you require both manoeuvrability and as much stealthiness as possible, such as with this fighter. And moving well forward, we have multiple different testing equipment on a boom in front of the fuselage. Being a 28th scale prototype, there was no room left for the pilot, although I suspect that it was always part of the plan to test remote control. 
We know that the new B-21 radar is designed to be flown by both a crew or remotely, and I would expect that the sixth generation fighter would be the same. Here's a photo of the ground station virtual cockpit, with the throttles on the left and a control stick in the centre. There was a video camera on the nose of the aircraft, and a microphone that could provide noise from the engine to help orientate the pilot, and there was also a heads-up display as well. Drones have been used for decades as targets, but they were coarse and basic. Fighters, bombers and surveillance aircraft would require much greater finesse, and this was one of many aircraft that pioneered this technology. This took part in 31 successful flights in 1997, hence the 31 stickers here on the side. It was a huge success, and NASA predicted that it was around one-tenth of the cost of developing a full-size prototype. Now the F-22 first flew in 1997, in fact the same year as this aircraft, so it would make sense that sixth generation fighter research, known with the Americans as the next generation air dominance program, was already in the early stages. There's no onboard gun as we expect that the dogfights will no longer happen, which we also told ourselves with the F-4 Phantom II development and they ended up having to add an external gun pod on afterwards. But having said that, this is just an early prototype and guns could be fitted to the larger production version if deemed necessary. Let's have a look at the power plant, which was a single Williams F-112 turbofan producing 700 pounds of thrust, propelling it to a top speed of 280 miles an hour and an altitude of 20,500 feet. These performance figures weren't really a priority with this program. Other than these prototypes, this engine is primarily used in cruise missiles, such as the AGM-129 ACM. It is unstable in both the pitch and yaw axes. Therefore, an advanced single-channel digital fly-by-wire control system stabilizes the aircraft. It was also used to test the advanced flight control system's ability to maintain control even if there was a failure of a control surface due to either damage or dysfunction. Every time, when the engineers intentionally caused a failure, the software compensated and allowed it to land safely, avoiding the need to use the onboard emergency parachute. In many ways, something like this would make for a perfect sixth generation fighter, and it's interesting that the program was going so well, but suddenly went quiet. It would not be ridiculous to think that maybe it was going so well that they decided to close the program publicly and continue it secretly. Having said that, it might be a little odd to leave this on display, although maybe they've learned a lot and modified the design heavily, therefore leaving it on public display might actually be a red herring to confuse opposing governments. Here's a silhouette released by Lockheed Martin on their social media page, which we would all suspect is a hint at their 6th gen fighter. If you squint, it does have a similar shape to the X-36, albeit without the canards, although again, this could be a red herring itself to distract when the real thing might have them. Multiple other modern fighters, including the Eurofighter Typhoon and even the Su-57, has a canard-like movable extension forward of the main wing, so canards clearly have their advantages. If I was attempting to confuse the enemy into thinking that I wasn't going to use them, then I would allow Boeing and Lockheed to release images, suggesting otherwise, and maybe that's exactly what has happened. Otherwise, there is very little that we know about the American 6th Gen fighter program, other than that they are already flying, and it remains a competition between Boeing and Lockheed, after Northrop Grumman announced that they won't be making a bid. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the upcoming American 6th Gen fighter, and if you think it will be anything like the X-36 here on display. Maybe it'll come with a tail section after all of this speculation anyway. Please comment below and check out my channel for many other similar videos. Thanks for watching.